we are going to start. We start the, to record the session. Okay, thank you. So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here at the Trans and Variable Stars Science Collaboration Session. Maybe for the talk, I can okay. move the mask. Um, this is a parallel session organized by Rachel Street, which is uh, connected remotely today. It's very early in the morning for her, and I thank her for joining us. And uh, from myself, I'm Sara Bonito, a researcher at the Observatory of Palermo in Italy, uh, part of the National Institute for Astrophysics. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to remind you that we have a code of conduct. You can uh, find more details uh, also on the website of, the, of this meeting. Uh, we share the values of kindness, trust, respect, diversity, inclusiveness. And uh, if you uh, witness some harassment, please contact the people who, who volunteer to um, uh, be our contact point for that, the armband person. And check on the uh, uh, badge of, of all the uh, people here in person, the contact comfort level stickers. So you can find here information also of the science collaboration uh, of all of us. Thank you for masking indoors. Um, you can uh, just release it while you're giving your talk. And uh, more information, you can contact the local organized committee, which is uh, given a, a lot of help. And the uh, uh, presenter can uh, uh, appear on record if you don't want to. Uh, um, please be aware uh, to not to uh, use the video or the to mute when you are not uh, talking, and to use the microphone. This one for the speaker, and another one will be uh, used for questions for the audience. And a crew is filming part of a doc documentary uh, today. And uh, uh, if you don't want to, uh, make sure to have the black uh, sticker on your um, on your uh, badge. And can, you can also join the conference and a lot of information join the Slack channel of this conference. So this is uh, the agenda for today. Uh, after this um, uh, first uh, overview on trans and variable stars that I will give you in a minute, um, many uh, scientific topics uh, and uh, analysis tool and uh, task forces highlight will be uh, discussed during this session. And at the end, we also have the opportunity of flash talks uh, for people that have prepared also pre-recorded video that are uploaded on a YouTube channel of the meeting. Okay, let's start with some information on transcendent variable star science collaboration. The co-chairs are Rachel Street, uh, that today is connected remotely, and uh, Federica Bianco, which is uh, uh, here in person at this meeting. You can find more information on the official YouTube uh, channel of the Transcendent Variable Star Science Collaborations, where we have collect collected many videos, tutorials, or uh, talks uh, um, by the members of the Transcendent Variable Star Science Collaboration, TBS. It is an international collaboration with more than 400 members uh, in uh, 17 countries worldwide, as you can see here in this map. And therefore, uh, it is a recipient of many uh, in-kind contributions that will be also discussed in the next section in the next days, uh, led by Aprajita. Uh, on the website, you can find uh, the statement of values uh, and all the information on the mm, subgroups. In fact, uh, TBS consists of different subgroups that focus on scientific topics and uh, um, a very wide range of scientific topics are covered uh, by definition on, um, in uh, transient variable stars. So you can find some of them uh, here. Uh, and, um, um, some subgroups are more focused on uh, analysis tools that quite often are shared among um, a very diverse range of scientific topics. I think this is a, a point of strength of this science collaboration because uh, um, collaborations can be forced between uh, groups that uh, scientifically are uh, focusing on uh, 
different uh, scientific case, uh, so from uh, uh, supernova to young stars, uh, but uh, uh, using common tools, and here you can see so uh, classification characterization or the brand new group focus on data visualization and characterization mm -hmm. but i would like also to highlight that uh, um, among these groups one is uh, dedicated to justice equity diversity and inclusion which are um, uh, very important topics for for us and uh, as for the general uh, plans to be engaged with the TVS. Uh, the general uh, uh, transient variable stars, uh, uh, telecoms are uh, twice per month, but uh, each subgroup and task forces uh, meet generally once per month. Uh, and you can also be involved in uh, checking on the Slack channels here, uh, just a list of some of uh, them you can easily find by the label TVS and then the name of the subgroup of the task force. Uh, we are working on commissioning cadence intimidation. Uh, we will see also in the uh, next talks and a uh, few slides on mine. Uh, this sense collaboration is a recipient to several in kind contribution and focus also on inclusion uh, topics. Uh, the diversity of the scientific uh, topics covered in such uh, um, uh, scientific uh, collaboration is also highlighted by the recently submitted uh, TVS roadmap document uh, led by uh, Kelly Hamilton. And uh, you can see here a list. Of Probably it's not a complete list. You can find more information on the submitted document of all the uh, scientific uh, topics covered uh, in uh, this science collaboration. Um, the transient um, variable star science collaboration consists of several subgroups, as I showed you before. But at the same time, on an early basis, uh, the community itself proposed to the chairs uh, some specific task on which we want to focus more in detail on uh, that specific year or in a couple of years. And uh, the, um, the active task forces in these couple of years, is, as you can also find on the website, this is just a screenshot from the website, are focused on survey strategy coordinated by Rachel Street, Data Preview Zero, Software Task Force, Commissioning Task Force, and Crowd Field Photometry. In the past years, we, we focus on Crowd Field Photometry, which is a long lasting uh, task force since through many years. Uh, the brokers or the planning for the drilling fields, I mean, surveys. And then uh, uh, last year, we focus more on uh, metrics on the use of the Rubin Science platform and the Stack Lab involvement. Um, again, the crowd field photometry and commissioning. As for the active task forces in these couple of years now, um, I will give some uh, briefly some information on some of them because uh, some will be um, discussed also during the talks uh, um, after mine. And so uh, service strategy task force will be also covered by the talk uh, by Rachel Street now. Then crowd field photometry will be also discussed during Massimo Dallora talk. Uh, I will give uh, some information on data preview zero task force, but uh, uh, Vincenzo Petrecca, which is a co-chair of this uh, task force, uh, will show uh, also an application of uh, uh, the use of uh, data preview zero. And so let me just uh, uh, give uh, um, some information on, on the other task forces not covered today. So as for the commissioning task force, this is coordinated by Marcus Rabus. And we have submitted uh, um, a commissioning note of transient variable stars uh, in uh, collaboration with Stars Milky Way Local Volume. As I was saying before, I think it is uh, very important uh, collaborations uh, be, um, among uh, groups working on different scientific topics uh, within transient variable stars itself, but also uh, within uh, uh, other sense collaboration in this case with the stars Milky Way local volume. Sorry for the acronym, I didn't specify. This is transient variable stars and stars Milky Way local volume, but 
also with AGN or solar system, just to make some example. And uh, uh, in this note, you can find also the wide range of scientific topics, as I showed before in the case of roadmap. Uh, sorry, this is a typo. Okay, for the software uh, that's first coordinated by Federica, this is focused on the identification of the tools that uh, uh, we need uh, within the TVS community and uh, also to lower the barrier to entry for the use of the software for the members of the science collaboration. Here you can find some more details, but of course, on the website of TVS, you can find more information if needed. As for the data preview zero task force coordinated by Vincenzo Petrecca and myself, um, we are using the simulations, so the data preview zero of um, the future Rubin uh, LSST data and uh, uh, practice using uh, the Rubin Science platform, developing also tutorials for the use of the portal aspect and the notebook tutorial, uh, also involving um, undergrad students uh, with um, internship. As an example, at this link, you can find an advanced tutorial based on the use of the portal aspect. We have seen uh, also this uh, today during the plenary session by Bob and by uh, Zelico some information on this. Uh, so the Ruby and also from a user, uh, Rubin Science Platform, this is the login page and uh, consists of three uh, different aspects, a portal for a quick exploratory look at the um, catalogs and uh, in-depth uh, analysis with the concept of um, going next to the data uh, to develop Jupyter Notebook in Python um, for the analysis of future data and the API aspect. Um, I would like also to highlight that uh, uh, last year, Eisen Simon Foundation awarded $900,000 to enable uh, astronomers to explore uh, uh, science with Rubin uh, Observatory for three science collaborations, solar system, Milky Way, so, um, subs Milky Way, local volume, and transient variable stars. And uh, the program lead is Rachel Street. And with these grants, uh, um, these grants has been used to support meetings and workshop of, for science publications, uh, in particular for a special issue focused on the cadence note uh, that has been submitted and uh, software uh, and also Kickstarter grants. Uh, Sorry for this. Uh, 35 Kickstarter grants uh, have been awarded uh, to PIs from nine countries. Here you can find more information. Sorry for this. Uh, uh, um, and uh, um, you can see that uh, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is also a subgroup of TVS, uh, was uh, um, um, a topic very important also. Um, in, in the context of this uh, program, in fact, uh, uh, many of the awarded the projects uh, focus their science also on uh, uh, mentoring for students uh, from historical black colleges and university and uh, minority serving institutes for inclusive, inclusivity training that will start uh, to be offered to the community by the end uh, in late uh, um, November or early December this year novel data visualization, sonification, and 3D printing to en enhance the accessibility to scientific results also for visually impaired uh, students and uh, researchers, and uh, also collecting information for refugee scientists, in particular during this, uh, in this period because of the war in Ukraine, and uh, fostering inclusive recruitment practices, which is very important in particular now because uh, mm, the activities of in-kind contribution programs will start. Okay, this is my last slide. And uh, so you can uh, keep in touch, you can uh, join the conversation on Slack, contact the chairs of TVS and uh, um, join a task force or a subgroup of TVS uh, at the link here of the website. So I will stop here. And uh, if you have uh, questions, I thank you for your attention. Otherwise, if you... I don't know if you don't have a question, we can uh, um, leave the floor to Rachel. 
Thank you. Any question from Slack? Uh, also, uh, the information for the people connected on Zoom, please prefer to uh, post your question on Slack so we can um, uh, monitor them and also uh, it will be useful for people that can see them later. Uh, so don't uh, put a question on Slack or no, on Zoom, but only on Slack. Any question from Slack? No? Okay. So, Rachel, are you connected? Do you, can you share your screen or we, we can uh, upload here the... So, hello, everybody. And uh, let me just share my screen here. Uh, okay, can you see my slides? Yes, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Sarah, uh, and thank you to everyone attending uh, this um, session for TVS. I'd like to note that I am presenting this uh, work of the TVS Survey Strategy Task Force, and of course that incorporates the work of a large number of people, uh, notably Sarah and Igor, Michael, Angelka, Dragana, many of the people who have organized this session uh, and several other members of TVS as well. So special thanks to them. TVS has, as Sarah noted, uh, the broadest range of science topics that uh, are encompassed by the science collaboration. And this arguably makes it one of the most difficult um, science collaborations to actually design a single survey strategy for. TVS authors led 45% um, of the survey strategy white papers that were submitted in 2018 and have made many other contributions on all of the topics that you see on the screen here. So it was a challenge uh, to come up with um, a single strategy that would actually serve all of the needs of uh, all of these science topics and to identify some of the um, challenges and the tensions between them. So the goal of the survey strategy task force was to analyze the survey simulations that have uh, been produced by the Rubin project using all of the TVS specific metrics that our members have contributed and to provide advice uh, to the survey strategy committee for Rubin regarding the TBS science and the interpretation of those metrics. And also, as I said, to identify the possible tensions between some of our science cases and ideally to come up with some kind of resolution. To that end, uh, we subdivided the task force into uh, three working groups. Even these have to cover uh, necessarily very, very broad regions of science. Uh, we have the, ex the galactic science group, which I coordinate. Uh, we have the extra galactic science group coordinated by Igor Adrioni and Michael Coughlin. Uh, and that includes everything from um, tidal disruption events uh, to supernova to cosmology. And we have the AGN and Deep Drilling Field uh, Working Group, which was coordinated by uh, Angelka Kovacevic and Dragan Ehrle. So earlier on this year, um, the Rubin project produced a very large number of survey strategy simulations. Um, this is work by Lynn Jones and P.E. Joachim. And there were hundreds of different alternative survey strategies that were proposed or variations on those strategies that were explored in order to find out 
what impact they would have both on the science that was they were proposed for, but also on the survey as a whole and everybody else's science. In the course of running of all of these survey strategy simulations, also known as OPSIMs, um, many of these metrics that have been produced to evaluate them were run by default, but these uh, science collaborations were invited to do more detailed and more nuanced analysis uh, in support of the Rubin team. So I'd like to just uh, briefly summarize some of the uh, results that have come out of our three working group. And in particular, to start with the extra galactic working group, I'd like to acknowledge all the contributions by everyone uh, who you see listed on the screen and um, all of the other TBS me um, members who actually contributed to the metrics as well and provided advice. This group in particular looked at metrics that have been submitted to the MAF for the kilonova populations, uh, for looking at the score that was proposed specifically for the Presto color strategy for kilonova. They looked at the total detected um, tidal disruption event population, and they looked at the um, detection rate for supernovas. Uh, their recommendations uh, were as follows. They um, were particularly keen on having a rolling cadence strategy. This is extremely beneficial for all of the extra night science. Um, they typically wanted at least uh, two bands of rolling cadence and a pretty heavily weighted one at a strength of 90%, um, meaning that most of the observations during a year would go towards the the band that was being observed that year. They particularly preferred stronger rolling cadence for the kilonova and supernovae classifications, but they did notice a tension that um, with the tidal disruption event recovery. And they also noticed that uh, rolling early on in the season, uh, that early on in the survey would be beneficial for the science. There were some extreme versions of rolling cadence that were explored, in particular a six band rolling cadence, and they found that this was particularly good for fast transient uh, recovery. But they emphasized the need to maintain um, a regular survey cadence in U band uh, epochs, which is necessary for the classification of some of the bluer transients. And for this reason, they did pay particular attention to the Presto color strategy. Uh, which they preferred that one, but with longer gaps, which was beneficial for the fast transients, but then had a trade-off that it was detrimental for some of the longer timescale transients. I also wanted to um, note there's work by Igor Andrioni uh, regarding the viable strategies for target of opportunity overrides, in particular to study gravitational waves and a search for optical counterparts. And I noticed there is a session, I believe it's tomorrow, uh, so uh, led by um, Raffaella Marguti. And I, if you're interested in that topic, I strongly encourage you to go to that session for more information. The next working group was uh, the AGN working group led by Angelka and Dragana. And they worked in particular in collaboration with the, A the AGN Science Collaboration. They have uh, submitted metrics uh, looking at the time lags measured for active galactic nuclei from two different regions, both the accretion disk and also the borderline region. And these they analyzed for a wide range of simulations. They did notice that the previous um, baseline footprint prior to the current version 2.0 was a little bit better than the current version. And this they thought was due to the fact that the current baseline includes more of the region in the high extinction galactic plane, uh, which is somewhat less good for AGN detection. They were fairly neutral on rolling cadence, provided they don't get extremely long gaps in the light curves, then uh, that was fine. Uh, the implication there is that they need to have regular cadence over um, multi-year timescales in order to get all of the uh, time lag timescales in the light curves. 
and they do have a, a slight preference for the strategies with the longer U-band observations. One interesting result that came out of this was uh, the twilight um, near Earth object strategies, which uses uh, time in twilight to emphasize particular areas of the low extinction region, may actually enhance their measurement of the time lapse. But they did notice, and they were not the only people to notice this, that short time scale lags uh, less than 10 days are not likely to be well characterized in LSST data. Uh, the third working group was uh, the Galactic Science Group, and I'm indebted to many, many people for their uh, contributions in this particular working group across many, many different times of science in the galactic plane. We've looked at a wide range of metrics uh, that cover lots of different populations, everything from microlensing to pulsating variable stars, uh, periodic and non-periodic, uh, and transient um, phenomena. So there was qu some quite detailed analysis has been taking place. Our inclusions uh, were that we strongly recommend uh, regions in the galactic plane and Magellanic clouds to be included in the wide fast deep. This was enormously beneficial to a very wide range of science. Um, but we noticed in the baseline uh, version 2.0, there was um, quite a centrally condensed region in the galactic plane that was included. And we recommended that more visits to a wider range of galactic longitudes um, be considered. We emphasized the value of early cadence observations because it's helpful to identify uh, the periodic variables. And in doing so, if you not only can you study the periodic variables, you can also better distinguish them from transient variables later on. We also noticed that um, variables of short time scales, by which we mean less than 25 days, are not detectable across most of the galactic plane. Um, this is somewhat uh, enhanced if rolling cadence is applied to the galactic plane, and that does enable quite a lot of short time scale science but we did emphasize that long gaps between the seasons do need to be avoided so that we don't um, neglect some of the longer timescale phenomena. Rolling is particularly valuable in the galactic bulge if it is um, timed to coincide with the Roman survey of the same area, then you get both the optical and the infrared data on the same region. We did tend to recommend a redder filter balance than would be used for the wide fast deep. Um, this is because we're looking into high extinction fields, which is not to neglect the importance of uh, the blue earth band passes, especially for young stellar, um, young stellar regions and so on. We ad advocated for uh, getting good seeing reference images. Uh, this is particularly beneficial if you're doing photometry in crowded reference fields. And lastly, I did want to note that uh, we have a number of proposals we submitted for micro surveys, which uh, have not really been taken into consideration by the SCOC yet. Uh, these included uh, surveys of the Carina region and other star forming region, um, the coordination of the Roman bulge survey with uh, that mission and a microlensing proposal made for the small Magellanic cloud. I mentioned that we recommended a revised survey footprint in the galactic plane and quite a bit of work has been put in to propose a region that was um, more representative of the high priority regions that our members identified that they would like to look at. So on the left hand side, you can see the baseline 2.0, uh, which shows what's called the diamond region in extending into the galactic plane. It does also cover the Magellanic clouds. And on the right hand side is the revised um, field of interest that we have proposed which takes into account the, the galactic bulge, Magellanic clouds, allows for several lines of sight through the galaxy for the purposes of microlensing. 
it also includes uh, a large number of star forming regions, uh, stellar clusters, and many more. And this is the subject of the UV 2.2 simulations. On a slightly different but uh, related topic, I did want to say a, a word about the impact of lower orbit satellites on a Rubin. Uh, this is particularly a uh, concern to the project as a whole, and they have recently issued a statement regarding the impact of satellite constellations, uh, which you can see linked on the screen. There is a risk because the, the number of uh, satellites in low Earth orbit is dramatically increasing. Uh, and it, if all of the planned satellite constellations go ahead, then we're looking at a population of around 400,000 uh, over the next decade or so. And uh, some simulation work has been conducted by the project and they concluded that Rubin really cannot avoid them by scheduling around them. There's just too many of them. Uh, they will be affecting the data and they could affect a large number of uh, the images, 30 or more percent. You can see on the right hand side uh, a simulated image of what one of these satellites will look like in a Rubin data frame. You can see how bright these objects are, but you can also see uh, the camera artifacts that are caused because of the crosstalk between detectors and the saturated streak. It's not possible to fully remove this signature in data processing, so this is going to have a serious impact. Uh, on the results of LSST. And so I strongly encourage everybody to take a look at that statement um, and uh, become more aware of this issue. And I will stop there and pause for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Question from the audience? Yeah, there is a question here from... By Massimo Dallor. Hi, Rachel. Thanks for, uh, for the talk. I have a curiosity about the, uh, the, the, the satellites in the sense that uh, most of them uh, are basically low altitude uh, satellites. So uh, the major effect is uh, uh, probably is, uh, during the, um, uh, the dusk and, and the dawn. So I was wondering what is uh, uh, the real impact on uh, the on the Rubin LSST operation. Thank you. That is true. Um, a lot of them are visible, especially at dusk and dawn. That's not to say that they're not visible throughout the rest of the night. They are, um, but they are particularly visible and particularly bright at dusk and dawn. And one of the most immediate impacts that that is having is that the Twilight Neo survey that was proposed by the Solar System Science Collaboration, they are actually considering having that uh, very early on in the first years of LSST because they are concerned that they're not going to be possible to do it later on in the survey. And that's, that's quite a, a frightening thought. And obviously it impacts the scheduling of everything else in LSST. But it's also not true that um, the objects are not visible throughout the rest of the night. Uh, the, the very low altitude ones at around uh, 550 kilometers, those are primarily visible at twilight, but there are there is a population of higher altitude uh, satellites like the OneWeb satellites are, I think around 900 kilometers, and those are visible all night. Uh, so we don't get away from this problem. Thank you, Rachel. Other questions for Rachel? Hans Lock. Uh, Rachel, I have a question myself. You, you showed that uh, uh, you divided the uh, service strategy task force into three different topics because of the nature itself, by definition, transcend variable stars, this very diverse range of scientific topics. So there is also a tension among uh, the filter choice or the, the footprint or the cadence, which is the definition of what is the optimization service strategy. Can you comment on that, please? 
the, how, how to manage this tension. I mean, other science, other science uh, collaborations uh, submitted a single cadence note, which wasn't impossible for us in TBS. Can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Yes, there are some tensions uh, that are kind of being resolved. The way we have managed to propose some strategies which uh, do most of the science for most people. There have, for example, by um, proposing a filter balance that doesn't exclude certain filters, so you will get data in some filters, uh, but maybe adjust the weighting a little more towards certain filters in certain areas, for example, high extinction regions. And so we've been looking for compromises in, in that respect to try and propose alternative strategies and to engage with the different groups where um, there are tensions to try and find a workable compromise in both cases. Um, but yes, it, there has been a, a great deal of, of talking and negotiation and eventually the SCOC will have to make the decision. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. It was not, not easy at all. And on, on November, there will be the SUC meeting. So we will further discuss this. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, again. Thank you. OK, so the next speaker is Massimo Dallora. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I thank the organizers to give me the, the opportunity to, to uh, tell you something about our activity in, uh, uh, in the joint uh, SARS Milky Way Local Volume and TVS Crowd Stellar Fields Task Force. I, I hope that I push the, the true button. So our Crowd Stellar Fields Task Force was born in 2018 and uh, Basically, uh, both the science collaboration form in the, in the, independently their, their, uh, this task force to study the impact of the, the crowding on, on the stellar photometry, on the stellar uh, science. And this two task force merged in 2022. Okay, maybe I have the, no, this, sorry. Okay, so uh, now this is the, uh, more or less the, the, the number of people involved in, in this uh, um, task force. You can see uh, there the, the contacts, our Slack channel, so everybody is more than welcome to, to join our uh, activities. Uh, what we fo focus on so far, uh, I apologize with the, uh, the people that, who already saw these slides a few weeks ago, I promised that I changed the, the, the conclusions. And uh, the, the idea was to, uh, to share with the, the community our expertise, our uh, experience on, uh, on, uh, on the crowded fields photometry. So we focused on uh, precision PSF photometry in crowded fields. We made some experiments on forced photometry, then we moved to variability search in a field, fields finding, cadence experiments, and so on. So basically, we focus on the DIA objects, uh, second catalogs, and then uh, we plan to, to share our, uh, our catalogs within the science platform. So let's start with the science case, for example, the galactic bulge, you know, uh, which is a very complex environment with, uh, uh, for example, uh, x shaped the structure based on red clump stars. Uh, it has a... Uh, um, uh, um, a distribution in the in the reddening in the metallicity so a very very, very complex environment and uh, this is why we are very interested in uh, uh, in this topic uh, we planned uh, to use RLS stars as a probe of the bulge structure for example we can use RLS stars uh, with uh, this uh, method developed by Bonetal 2018 to simultaneously 
uh, estimate the distance, the reddening, and the metallicity to, to RLS stars, but also we have a processional models which predict the, the behavior of uh, RLS stars in the ruby analysis filters. There is a nice paper led by Marcella Marconi et al. this year. And uh, also we, um, um, we explore the possibility uh, to where this, uh, this method can be extended. For example, we made some computation with uh, Will Clarkson and other uh, colleagues interested in the topic. And we found that we, can, uh, we could probe the, pro the, the bulge up to 10 uh, kiloparsec. So as a crowd of stellar field task force, uh, we have some curiosities. For example, we have a huge statistics. So how many RLS stars we can find in the bulge? How to quickly recognize them and characterize them? Uh, not waiting for the end of the survey, I mean, after 10 years. So after how much time? And what is uh, more specifically the impact of the crowding on the quality of the, our photometry? So we uh, started with uh, a case study, the uh, very dense galactic global class NGC, NGC 6569. Uh, we found in, uh, uh, in the Decam archive uh, uh, a very good uh, photometric set in five bands. And this is heavily contaminated by the field. And on, uh, on this, we have a lot to experiment and learn. So basically we started with the photometry with uh, uh, a full PSF reduction based on a frame. Later on, I will show you what is the meaning of an off-frame reduction on, a, on a, a such a crowded field. We perform a fully automated PSF photometry, so no visual check of the stars, and uh, the, the pipeline was completely automatic, and the calibration was uh, kindly provided by Ibiza in advance of publication. So then we moved to variability, so we searched for variability uh, on the basis of the spread of the photometry and the FFT power spectrum. We search for the periods with the FFT algorithm, a long scalgo, for example, but also the phase dispersion minimization. We cross match uh, our catalog with the already known variables uh, uh, made available by Ogle. And uh, this is the only uh, part, the final part when we uh, read a trick in the sense that we manual checked the light course, of course, reason this will not be possible when we will have 10 million variable objects per night. What is your frame strategy? We start from individual uh, poise palace function. We have a source list on a stack of the images, and then we simultaneously fit this list on all the available images. In this case, this is not exactly a forced photometry approach because in this case, when we uh, talk about the simultaneous, we mean that the position and fluxes are simultaneously cross-matched on all the available Im images, regardless, for example, uh, from the filter. This, uh, allow, oops, sorry, allows you to have a, a more, di a deeper and a more precise photometry. For example, this is a, a simple comparison of the field uh, uh, in, uh, uh, around the, the globular cluster, which here in red, you see uh, the a color magnitude diagram made with a simple force of the photometry. And this is what you have when you adopt your frame strategy. So uh, there is a, a, a big difference. Oops. Okay. So this is, these are the residuals between the, the forced photometry and your frame uh, catalog. Uh, some results. Uh, with Oga in the field, we already knew that there, are, there were 29 other stars, 80 eclipse and binaries, three delta scuti, four ellipsoidal variables. And then we discovered new candidates, nine RL stars, five eclipse in binaries, 10 delta scuti. I can, uh, this is a nice color magnitude diagram with a comparison with, uh, with Gaia. And these are some new, uh, com very com uh, convincingly variable uh, objects uh, with the, the, the simple red uh, circles uh, you see the new uh, the new objects. This is 
this is in the field and in the middle of the, of the cluster. So we are very happy with the quality of our photometry. But also we uh, take a look, took a look at the efficiency of, uh, of the um, white, fast and deep uh, um, strategy on the variability. For example, we discovered that after 15 epochs, with a 20 days cadence in a single filter, basically we were able to uh, we are able to discover most of the the first overtone, which are the sinusoidal type uh, pulsators. Uh, things uh, go much much worse with uh, the fundamental type RR stars. And uh, again, after 30 epochs, which means uh, uh, basically. Uh, one year after the beginning of the survey, one, one, well, 18 months after the beginning of the survey, we, uh, we can recover uh, much better the RRS stars. Uh, here the, there is a period of relation, again, a nice color magnet diagram. I have two warnings. The first one is uh, about the calibration, which is a, a major issue in the bulge. You see a, a, a comparison with the APAS, the ATLAS, DECAPS, and the BDBS survey, which uh, use the same, basically, as the SSM, um, the Sloan filter system. And uh, this is already, uh, was already explored in, in, uh, in the, the literature. You, here you can see, for example, the difference between the BDBS and uh, uh, the DECAPS. And again, you see an, another comparison between BDBS and DECAPS. So there are huge differences in both the photometric zero point and in the color uh, correction behavior. So I think that this will be a major issue, especially when, uh, uh, with the bulge, when we will uh, uh, decide we will be uh, active. The second warning is about, uh, is not on the reduction side, but on the uh, explanation of the, the results, is about the reddening. In this area, we have a strong differential uh, reddening and you have uh, completely different values according uh, to the strategy, according to the tracer that, that uh, have been used to, to compute the, the reddening. So again, this is, uh, I think this will be a major problem in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, discussing our results in the future. So I will end with uh, some experiment on the completeness in the crowd of fields. Uh, we are just at the beginning with Leo Girardi, more or less we are, uh, of course, these are just data uh, with DECAM. So we have to rescale all this stuff to expected LSST performance. But as you can see, we, are, uh, we have the 50% uh, uh, completeness uh, at uh, 20. So we are uh, uh, happy about the, uh, the results. This is uh, um, an interesting, uh, uh, these are two interesting point, uh, plots based on the Peter Setson uh, um, parameter about the crowding, the, the so-called separation. Here you see uh, the labels one, two, three point five, four and five. This is the fraction of the flux of the contaminating uh, objects uh, around the sources. So here you can see that uh, uh, the contamination and the confusion uh, limit is a major issue with the, with the, the, the photometry. And um, uh, on, the, on the right, you see the, the run of the photometric error as a function of the, of the magnitude with a different level of contamination. And here, here you can see the histogram of the number of the found uh, sources as a function of uh, of the, the contamination, the so-called separation. And Fisher work, write a paper, I'm too lazy, uh, about NGC 6569. We are going to perform a full DIA analysis, uh, a comparison with, uh, with the, the a full DIA uh, analysis and uh, or frame about uh, variable stars. We will extend this work to the full DECAM bulge data set. We, we, have, uh, we want some, uh, uh, um, time at the enough play, player the computing facility. And this is this part, this work is also part of the Italian in-kind contribution on crowded fields. 
So I will end with a crowd of feelings. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. Questions for Massimo? There is uh, two. Uh, Massimo, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the talk. I, I would like to go back with this uh, serious problem about the calibration. And uh, I really appreciated the, the fact that you didn't mention at all the U band. But unfortunately, this is a band that we would like to use. Uh, so I was wondering whether, uh, and we have also a problem that we have no ADC at the telescope. Uh, so I uh, I was uh, wondering whether uh, we do have a plan to to improve the the photometric accuracy in this band that is uh, quite important. Also, not trivial the fact that is not going is going to saturate significantly uh, later than than uh, or earlier. It depends on the point of view uh, compared with the other bands. So I. I was wondering whether there is something new about that. Yeah, Giuseppe, you are absolutely right. And, uh, you know, the U-band, I think it will be a pivotal filter band for, for the survey. I strongly support this, uh, this band. Uh, the problem probably is about the kind of calibrators that you are going to use. For example, with ABISA, we discovered that using a set of spectrophotometric uh, white dwarfs to calibrate, which are really good in, uh, uh, in the yellow and the disc. When you try to use this kind of a calibrator in the bulge, you are changing, um, you are changing the, the crowding, of course, but you're also changing the, the stellar population and uh, you are changing the, the, the reddening and uh, also you are more prone to for example, the effects of the filters, for example, a red leak. So this is a major problem. Maybe, maybe uh, we have to test this. We can uh, try to use uh, um, the spectrophotometry delivered by Gaia on the brighter part. And so we can uh, use their photometry and their spectra and produce uh, synthetic photometry to to anchor uh, our uh, our uh, photometry, but this is uh, just a preliminary answer that I gave to myself, basically. Is there another question? Or a quick question for Massimo? No? Okay, so let's thank Massimo again. Next speaker is Fabio Ragotta. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Fabio Ragossa. I'm a postdoc at the, University, at the Observatory uh, of Rome. And today I'm going to talk you about, again, for some of you, about the project uh, uh, developed with uh, um, Silvia Viranomonte, Igor Andreoni, and Tommaso Amada on how well we can know uh, parameter estimation from uh, kilonova light curves. Um, I'm saying it again because I presented this work, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, but now it's updated with the conclusion. So be, be focused. Uh, so again, the kind of conduct and the engagement. So the outline. So uh, first of all, this is the outline, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, basically, we will focus on um, characterize the, uh, the subject of the work, and then we will go uh, talking about the methods and uh, directly to the uh, results and the conclusion. So first of all, what is the, su the, the subject of, the, uh, of this study? It is uh, kilonovi, which are counterpart of uh, the merging of a binary compact object. Uh, kilonovi are uh, the uh, 
the radiation that is coming from the uh, decay of the uh, air processes in the neutron rich environment. This neutron rich environment came from, in this case, in the case we are uh, considering, from the merging of um, compact, the binary compact object. But the uh, radiation is not the only messenger we will detect. Indeed, uh, this plot from Fernandez Metzger 2016 showed the different phases of the evolution of the merger of the merger and the a different kind of signal we can detect from it from the gravitational waves to the gamma rays the, uh, and uh, up to the uh, to the radiations and using these other messengers to localize the uh, the position of the of our candidates we ended up with these localization, huge localization regions that we are used to see if we uh, look at the gravitational waves uh, uh, data, um, that we hope we can survey very fast with LSST. Uh, and not to to be uh, to wait about the lucky case of GW seventeen zero eight seventeen. So, what is the kind of of of, of source of um, of light curve we expect to see? Uh, comparing uh, these, these, these two plots compares the uh, photometrical evolution and the color evolution of typical supernova light curves with respect to the only case we know about the kilonova. As you can see, the, um, the evolution is much faster in uh, photometrically speaking. And uh, uh, from the colors, uh, the evolution in, uh, to the reddening is faster again. So we, uh, we expect to, uh, to, cons to have uh, this kind of, uh, to deal with this kind of, of objects. Uh, a work from, Andre from Igor Andreoni uh, this year uh, showed that uh, if we uh, apply some, this kind of, uh, of filtering for on the uh, rapidity at which the, uh, the, you know, the, the light curve uh, evolve uh, to, um, to the data, um, we go to thousands. Uh, th these are these are in the on the y-axis are relative numbers with respect to the simulation they did that are they simulated the five five hundred thousand of, of kilonova light goes through the entire footprint. So we go to uh, you know an order an order of thousands of hundreds of kilonovi up to 14 uh, 1400 megaparsecs in the blue where the filtering uh, the, the filtering criteria is just uh, uh, do I have at least two detection on the light curves to uh, a an order a one a, an entire order of magnitude less if we ask uh, as a filtering criteria to have uh, at, uh, to have the um, to have the the fading the fading uh, uh, rate uh, up to 0 0.3 magnitude per day, uh, so we expect to actually detect a few numbers of to classify at least a few numbers of light curves as as kilonovi. But the uh, the question we no oh, sorry the question we uh, we ask is how well we can know uh, the physics. Uh, that this light curve is trying to uh, to show us. And to answer this question, we um, we we thought about this this project. So um, we started with a model that is the, the model from Metzger uh, 2017. That is a very simple model that uses just three parameters uh, to describe the, to simulate the light curve. These three parameters are the man, the, the ejecta mass, the ejecta velocity, and the opacity. So uh, the considering a a parameter, a prior parameter distribution for these parameters. Uh, we use uh, this software. If if you are interested in, in what this software is uh, is about, you can ask me later. This is the software is called uh, um, Nuclear Multi Messenger Astronomy, and this in here is uh, uh, abbreviating as NMMA to produce the simulated uh, uh, light curves, uh, changing the the um, the parameter values to simulate a, a huge amount of of these templates. Then we apply the constraint, the observation constraint to this light curve to produce some observed, let's say observed the LSST kilonova light curves. And then we use again an MMA to fit the observed light curves to extract the values of the um, of the, param the model's parameters. And, we, uh, and then we compare the uh, inferred values with the injected values to see how well we were, uh, uh, we were able to um, reproduce the description of the, uh, of the kilonovi. So this is uh, uh, one example in a fixed uh, uh, point location in the sky um, where we uh, injected the, uh, the light course, uh, the kilonova light course uh, uh, in, uh, in the boulder line. Uh, and we, uh, 
produced applying the, the observational constraint, the, uh, the, observed, uh, the observed kilonova light curves. Uh, the different columns are three time windows during the, uh, the entire uh, uh, LSST uh, survey, survey durations. And the, the three rows are three different distance, uh, uh, distance configuration. As you can see, uh, it's important to, uh, to catch uh, uh, the kilonova in the right time windows in, if I'm using a wide fast deep uh, uh, the, the wide fast deep survey otherwise i will need the target of opportunity to improve the inform the, no the, the number of, inf of information i can use to uh, to infer the, mo the model's parameters here uh, this is you know maybe a very complicated uh, plot to describe in few seconds but i will try each column is a uh, different feature of the light curve we can extract just by looking at the uh, at the detection on the light curves uh, and the different uh, the different row are just again the different uh, distance configuration as you can see the fact that we are looking at the uh, at, sor at sources that are located the different distance Distances, this impacts somehow uh, on the um, on the features we can uh, we can extract from the light curves, and so uh, we mm, we decided to look deep into this uh, um, this thing and and ask ourselves how these different kind of uh, uh, of features uh, impact the ability to um, to infer these parameters so we analyze the systematics on the on the uh, on the fitting procedure analyze the uh, the effect of the changing number of filters the, the magnitude peak and the number of uh, detections on the light curves here you can see the, uh, the the plot of the performance of our filter fit detection that basically describes a proxy uh, of how well we can uh, how well we can uh, reproduce the light curve and how well we can infer uh, the uh, the parameter the value the, the model parameters uh, and here you can see that improving the number of detection we improve our performance as you as it happen if we uh, uh, if we increase the number of filters but something will happen if we change the 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 peak magnitude you know there is you see sorry there is this um, uh, this value here. Uh, it was around 24 magnitude, uh, where the, the the performance is increased with respect to the general trend. Uh, what we um, con what we saw uh, it was happening is that the, the the parameter the parameter space was able to, um, the the, the fit, sorry the the sampler the the Bayesian sampler was able to constrain at least one of the parameters uh, in the parameter space. You can see here in the best performing uh, um, case uh, here the the money the, the ejecta mass was well constrained here was a little bit uh, shallower but here was almost like uh, um, uniform uh, so the, the ability to constrain at least one of the model's parameters uh, help us uh, inferring the, all the others so uh, what was uh, what this an effect of the of the sampler or, or was this an effect an effect of the model uh, and the and so we we analyzed this uh, uh, this case and we sh and we demonstrated that actually it was an effect of the model uh, analyzing the uncertainties that we can infer from the models itself it happened that uh, uh, the, the 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 model itself was very um, ejecta mass dependent with respect to the, the ejecta velocity uh, parameters. So uh, that's why the uh, the ability to inf to constrain the ejecta mass um, allow us to uh, constrain all the others uh, all the others parameters. Finally, we uh, extract the distribution of uncertainties uh, from our, uh, from you know, from uh, the fitting of all our uh, LSST observed kilonovi, and we um, we show uh, here is showing. Uh, the, this basically this, the discrepancy in the upper uh, column in the upper row and the actually the uh, relative uh, error of the post, you know extracting the posterior the the the, uh, the variance of the posterior distribution of the um, uh, from the from the sampling as you, um, here here the, the results are not so much comforting because you see there is like uh, the the case that uh, um, the inferred parameters are affected uh, by 
you know, the 60 is like the, the error on the parameters are like the 60% more or less uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the parameter values. If we, um, if we uh, consider as an error, as an, as an uncertainty, is this, the, uh, the variance from the, uh, from the sampling, from the fitting sampling. But still, uh, these are stuff we can work on and we can improve the ability to constrain the model's parameters using different sampler. So this is actually comforting, but it's because he's, he's telling us we can work, we can improve, and by the uh, the data the data release, we can have like a machinery that we can allow us to uh, to constrain these uh, these model parameters. Finally, uh, just the last the, the last slide, uh, there is the comparison of the ability to infer these uh, uh, these values uh, uh, with respect to the the different survey strategies. I I, I cut out all the names because. Otherwise, the the the, the, the plot were overwhelming. But I uh, show the three main uh, um, opsins that uh, um, work better in the different uh, distance range. And uh, if you can see, if if you um, if you have some, uh, you know, if if you know what these opsim are about, uh, you can uh, you can see that uh, these opsims are the one that allow us to have much revisit a number of revisit higher with respect the other options and these allow to have colors uh, information uh, so uh, having color information uh, will improve our ability to constrain the physics uh, that we can know from the um, from the kilonova light curve so, uh, so all of these are in this conclusion and because i'm out of time uh, i'm looking forward to see the lsst sky and to work and to see uh, kilonovi thank you Thank you. Questions for Fabio? Questions as well? No? Oh, a quick question there. Okay. I, uh, just quickly, were there other peaks? Uh, there were other peaks. Uh, were those uh, also with colors that uh, uh, were with here? The color, or is there something that compensates? Sorry, you mean here? Yeah, it seems that there are other peaks uh, that you didn't mark. Is that correct? You know, yeah, more I, or less similar height. So I was wondering what increases the efficiency there. Yeah, basically uh, the you know um, it's hard to see. It, it, generally, uh, each each line has like a, a general uh, a uniform trend uh, about the peak. Each color has a, a kind of uniform, a uniform peaks distribution. Then there are a few that are lower and fewer that are uh, higher. And the fact that the ones that are higher are the ones that uh, increase the number of revisit within the same night uh, of about three. You know, the the presto the the presto color um, in, have a, a internet internet gap about three hours to point. 2.5 hours. They change the number, the, the 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 gap to simulate different kind of revisit, uh, see, uh, the, the visit configuration, and also uh, the the long gaps uh, simulate longer intern internet gaps. As this is something that also Rachel show uh, from Igor's recommendation from the you know the extra galactic the fast transient uh, recommendation that having uh, higher um, higher intranight gaps. Uh, within the same night, um, help like characterizing the past transient. This kind of match of what they already say. Then that the, in this sense, it would, the, these results were comforting because we are on the uh, on the on the right path. Um, I, I hope this answered the question. Thank you. There Any was this quick, oh, oh. Uh, a very quick question, maybe here. Yeah. At which point the change in magnitude and color are so uh, unique that you feel confident triggering a major eight meter observatory to give a follow up? <laughs> uh, actually, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't tell. Uh, a, um, a threshold in magnitude or color, but on how fast. The, the evolution is so uh if we are able to constrain the uh 
that's 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 the main the main problem is you know the if if i can show the one of the first slide yeah this one uh that's uh, that's the main that's the main problem because to um to constrain the the rapidity of the evolution we need more than a couple of uh, of, of detection um in this sense, uh, LSST could be helpful if the strategy allow uh, the um, you know some revisits within the same night, so, or uh, at, you know just to be sure that we are not missing some features from the, uh, from the light. Curve. But also the revisit in the same night has not to be too much uh, close to each other because we have to give the the, the, the events to evolve. So um, yes, I, I will. I will have a threshold on the uh, on the evolution uh, on how fast the 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 the, photo the photometry old color evolve, uh, not just uh, about the yeah, the the magnitude itself. Yeah, my, my question was also related to like what kind of contaminants do you expect? And uh, I guess the, the other comment is that you assume that you know the distance uh, of the galaxy, yes. but we know that the, the galaxy catalogs are severely incomplete. So uh, is this an exercise that you're planning to do after the survey finishes and you are just going to look like at archival things or this is like a uh, real-time search where you're planning to detect things and like trigger other facilities because then you may lose things. Yeah, I was considering, I was assuming that in, in doing this exercise that the gravitational wave trigger uh, helped us constrain the distance and uh, constrain the location. But, um, you know, considering the information from the other messenger, um, it's likely to have at least some, some hint about the um about the feature about distance of the of the event and also of course the uh, the effect of contaminants uh is not taking is not considered here uh it, this was just an exercise high um on the Let's say on the last phase of all the uh, of, of all the workflow, I have a can I, I have the, the observation, I have the contaminants, I detect the candidates, I uh, I, I look at the, at the evolution. So I say, okay, this is a probable kilonova candidate because the evolution is very high, the, the evolution rate is very high. So let's uh, let's go with a follow up. Let's go with the, uh, the here is not considering follow up. It's just considering the uh, data release. Um, uh, LSST will have. So it's something that could be also doing the archival Im image once the LSST finish. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks Fabio again. The next speaker is uh, Victoria Bravo. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Vittorio Braga uh, from the uh, National Institute of, of Astrophysics in Rome since a few weeks. But uh, this work uh, that we're talking about and uh, that is a work in progress uh, uh, started uh, six months ago at the uh, Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias in Tenerife. So. Okay, let us start by uh, asking ourselves why templates are important in general. Well, first of all, what is a template? Uh, it, it, hmm? Okay, uh, it is simply uh, normally an analytical form of the shape of the uh, light curve, uh, which is typical for a kind of variable. I'm interested in uh, arrow light stars, uh, but uh, uh, of course, with the uh, uh, with, uh, changing period, the changing uh, uh, pulsation type, the um, uh, 
the shape is different. This is the J band. These are the J band templates uh, of uh, uh, of our other stars. And as you can see, there are both uh, first overton and three types of fundamental. Uh, for this, for this reason, there is and there is a concept. Uh, uh, there, there is a key concept in uh, uh, in templates that is uh, the binning, uh, that is uh, selecting, uh, uh, cutting the whole sample, for example, in amplitude or, or in period and in pulsation type to select uh, the different morphological types of, uh, of variables. Then group then uh, group them, cumulate uh, uh, the uh, empirical light curves, and from then and um, from uh, from the cumulated light curves generate the uh, to generate the uh, the light curve templates. There can be light curve templates, radial velocity curve templates, temp effective temporal tem loop curve templates, and so on. Uh, but the most um, uh, common are light to are light curve templates. So again, well, now why are templates so useful? Templates are useful because they save us uh, telescope and uh, reduction time. Let us imagine we have four uh, uh, variables and each of these has only three, uh, uh, three phase points. Of course, we would not be able to provide a, a good uh, um, fit of these light curves. But provided that we know normally from V band observations, since they are so common, the position type and the period, we select the right uh, template, the, the right uh, morphological uh, model, uh, model, and we use the template as a fit. And so we can have very precise mean magnitudes that for these stars means very precise distances. So let us ask, uh, why are templates for LSST bands so important? Well, of course, uh, uh, with time, uh, LSST will collect more and more uh, face points. But in the first, uh, especially in the first two years, uh, the, uh, the error on the mean magnitude can be can be quite large, up to 0. Point, even 0. 0.4 magnitudes. This depends, of course, uh, on the distance, on the period. Uh, but uh, this, was, this was tested with uh, a matrix uh, that uh, we have developed uh, here at ENAF. And, uh, and this can lead to errors on distances that can be larger than 10%, but even larger than, actually, even larger than 20, 30% at more than 500 kiloparsec. So starting from, uh, for example, Tucana, I see 1613 within the local group. So if we want a reliable uh, and accurate uh, mean uh, distances uh, within the first years of the LSST, if we want to take full advantage of the first years of LSST, we will... <laughs> We want to use templates also because, um, as I've told you before, uh, one needs uh, to use the templates. One needs one needs the previous knowledge of the period, but the previous no but the, the estimates of the period, even uh, in the first uh, years, so you, even in the first half year, uh, are very good for uh, uh, for LS, for LSST because uh, one can use uh, multi-band techniques uh, to. Uh, use all the all the available points uh, and uh, provide a, real, a more or less accurate uh, uh, estimate of the uh, of the period. This here the scale is one to the minus five. So, if we have a good period, if this uh, data allow us to have a good period but not good magnitudes, well, we this is really inviting us to use uh, uh, templates. Moreover, for a part of these stars, we will or we would already know the mean period from previous surveys like Casa San or Gold Catalina and so on. So I'm building these uh, templates uh, in the Ugris uh, in the Ugris bands, uh, but we do not have 
uh, LSST data. So what can what we can do is to collect uh, uh, UGRIS UGRIS um, uh, data from other surveys, for example, uh, the camera. I have collected data from uh, uh, in the, the public data uh, in the bulge and uh, in crater for 300 area. The largest sample is ZTF. The largest empirical sample is ZTF to uh, more, uh, almost 30,000 uh, RLI in the GR and I band. And I'm also using uh, pulsation models uh, uh, developed uh, in uh, enough Naples. In, in, and these are uh, in the LSST bands. So, uh to provide the templates one has to fit the fit the, the empirical light curves as i told before has to normalize because the templates are provided uh, uh the, the templates that one provides are normalized because after because uh, uh one has to rescale them by the amplitude so uh the de the de the decam sample was already processed uh, the uh, we already have normalized and cumulated light curves. This is this means that these are all the light curves uh, uh, in the R band for uh, fundamental type stars between p between 0.55 and 0.7 days uh, that are available uh, for Decam, uh, and uh, the fit of this cumulated uh, uh, light curve, which has thousands of uh, phase points. Uh, uh, will be our uh, analytical uh, template. For the ZTF sample, of course, it, mm, it's uh, uh, much more difficult because these are so many that uh, uh, I had to develop a, a, well, a simple uh, uh, neural network uh, based on uh, uh, all the types of, uh, 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 of uh, properties. Of the uh, of the of the of um, the light curves that I could find to separate the good ones uh, like these uh, from the bad ones like this bad ones means simply noisy uh, multiple mode blasco and so on the, all of these cannot be used to provide uh, uh, to provide templates we must have a uh, uh, clean light curves uh, and uh, the the uh, efficiency of the uh, of the neural network seems uh, uh, seems uh, satisfactory. However, well, uh, for uh, for for the moment, and this start and this and this is the real work in progress. The dispersion is really huge. I will work on uh, improving, uh, especially the 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 anchor the anchor epoch, and. Uh, I'm also uh, in the in the very last weeks. I I also started working uh, on the pulsation models. Uh, uh, now the pulsation models span very large range in uh, metallicity, uh, temperatures, masses, uh, and uh, so one has to. Uh, they also show these features that are never uh, seen uh, in uh, for in real time in real photometry. So these will have to be smoothed uh, and. Normalized and accumulated, and then fitted to provide the uh, to provide the templates. So, as a summary, uh, I'm, again, I'm sorry. This is a work in progress. I believe that these templates, once done, will provide will allow us to fully um, take advantage of the first years of LSST. There are some problems, uh, but these are problems due to the uh, uh, to the to the fact that uh, the empirical data from that I'm using to provide to build these templates is huge. Uh, uh, and of course, this is also a, an advantage. I, and I will try to um, transform, let's say, the disadvantage into an advantage. But again, this is uh, uh, still uh, uh, under, uh, uh, this is still in progress. Thank you, Victoria. Questions from, from Victoria? Yeah, there is one here from Masim. Uh, Vittorio, I was wondering uh, about, uh, I know that this is a turning problem, about Blasco pulsators, which can be about 50% for uh, 
a fundamental procedure and also a component, a strong component with the, the first overton. So if we are, uh, we, we have a way to cope with this kind of, uh, of uh, arrival stars. Uh, yes, let's say, uh, let's say this. Uh, first of all, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, fraction that you are mentioning is based, if I'm not wrong, on Ogle data, which uh, uh, is, of course, uh, uh, the, the best one for uh, concerning uh, this, uh, this kind of investigation. We have uh, the, the largest sample that I have is ZTF data that has a lot of uh, face points, but uh, still uh, one order of magnitude or even uh, I, I would say one and a half order of magnitude less. So uh, the the uh, the problem is reduced in the sense that uh, ZTF data are uh, not uh, with ZTF data even a very deep analysis would uh, provide uh, such a large uh, uh, fraction wouldn't allow to separate uh, uh, Blaschko stars with tiny uh, Blaschko amplitudes. And uh, secondly, I'm fine with the fact that I'm rejecting them because. Uh, uh, Let's say because uh, uh, templates by uh, by their by their own by this by the very idea of the templates of template one needs something that is uh, cleaner as cleanest as possible, and uh, it could be possible to uh, it could be possible to provide templates for either Blush or even um, double mode. But uh, this could would be a completely different work, uh, and I'm sure uh, that uh, they would not be used uh, uh, to, for example, find the precise mean magnitudes, uh, but more for, uh, uh, but more for uh, uh, comparison with the uh, theoretical models, uh, with the possession models, uh, and. Uh, um, and uh, and uh, and empirical data. So uh, it is a, it would be a completely different way of uh, consuming templates. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I decided just to put this aside because it would be uh, a, uh, a work that is that would be as large as this one alone. If it is a very quick question, because we are running out of time, sorry. So, Vittorio, uh, as I see for the R band that you showed that there is a large scatter, and I, I assume that you are using period binning to construct the templates, but since you are using GTF data for RL arrays in the halo or the field, they might have different metallicities. So even if you are binning the period, the light curves may, may be of RL arrays with different mean in metallicities, so their structure might be different, and that might be reflecting here. So, have you looked at, for example, considered using RL arrays in a specific global cluster, which is well populated, and then you at least don't worry about uh, variation in the light curve due to metallicity, and just do the period binning, like for omega sin that you did. Uh, you have a point. Uh, however, uh, the fact is uh, uh, now these are. Uh, uh, this figure uh, uh, seen on the screen like this uh, is a, might not be uh, really clear, uh, but uh, uh, let's say that uh, by looking many times of the, at uh, this kind of picture, figures, I made the eye, and uh, I I know that the, that, that there are uh, uh, in, that there are intrinsic. Uh, uh, I mean, I know that uh, within this period bin. Uh, for sure, there is what you are saying. For sure, there are. Uh, uh, for sure, for example, metallicity is affecting, uh, uh, and uh, let's say that there are uh, that uh, these beans should be separated into at least three beans with uh, different metallicities, and then we would find something that is a little more uh, uh, clean. But uh, I can tell you that I'm uh, 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 that I'm quite sure by the, by the way that uh, how uh, by the way how this is uh, dispersed that this is uh, uh, mostly due to uh, fluctuations on the anchor epoch which is uh, the epoch on the mean magnitude on the rising branch here this is the zero and uh, that uh, 
what you say uh, that what you say is there and in fact uh, i'm trying with this uh, bin but uh, i know that i will have to change it but is a secondary effect uh, the first there is uh, something to correct uh, on uh, on the epoch side on the uh, for, for the epoch okay thank you Victor again next speaker is Vincent Fotografo Okay, hello everyone. I am Vincenzo Pedretta, PhD student in Naples, and I will talk about supernovae using data preview zero. The analysis of supernova rays is extremely important to put constraints on their progenitors. As you can see in these two plots on the left, bottom left of the slides, where you see the, the, the rate of type 1A supernova, the volumetric rate, and the rate as a function of the suffering rate. And is also one of the point of the TVS roadmap. So among all the different supernova types, I'm going to focus on type 1A, which are pretty important cosmological probes. And I will show you preliminary results of a desk project about the, the, the analysis of the impact of systematic effects on the study of type 1A supernova rate. And I will do it using data from DP0 as part of a general effort of the TVS DP0 task force. Now, the point is that LSST will produce tons of data, and this will dramatically reduce the statistical uncertainties. So if we want to, to put better constraint on the progenitors, we need to think about the reducing the uh, systematic effects. There are many sources of systematics. I'm going to focus on these ones. After you select a sample of supernova candidates, you need to associate this transient to the correct galaxy. Then you need an estimate of the photometric redshift. You need a classification of different supernova types. And finally, you can get the rate. So we will see how all these effects are propagating toward the final measurement of the rate. How our sample of supernova comes from Sanchez et al. 2022. They are supernovae detected on different images on 15 square degree of the simulated DC2 universe. There are around uh, uh, 5,000 supernovae and half of them more or less undetected on the DIA sources. And we selected just supernovae with at least five distinct detections. And that's to have a light curve sufficiently long to, to have a, a classification. So our master sample is of about 600 supernovae candidates. Once we have our candidate, we need to associate this transient to the galaxy. So this is the, the, the input of the simulation. The probability of occupation of a galaxy is proportional to the stellar mass, and then the supernova is positioned in a way that it traces the, the light of the galaxy. And 10% of them have been simulated as hostless, and the correlation between the supernova type and the host galaxy properties is not included in the simulation. So this means that we cannot use this property in our algorithm, and we can just evaluate the volumetric rate. So we tested both the simple algorithm based on the minimum angular separation and a method called directional light radius adapted from Gupta et al. 2016, which consists of weighting some out the galaxies by taking into account the extension and the orientation. So we validated our results building cutouts from the RubinSense platform. And you can see this number here where the galaxies are ranked according to this metric. And here are our results. And you can see that the DLR method improves by a 10% the association efficiency if you use just the angular separation, which is affected by problem of uh, overlap between sources. And we also, um, for photometric redshift for all the candidate host galaxies. And here, when I talk about uh, spectroscopic redshift, I am actually referring to the simulated redshift. 
And a way to look of photometric crash shift, I am, I am using as a point estimation, the weighted mean value of the posterior PDF for each galaxy. And we have the photometric crash shift of the true galaxy because it is a simulation. And we also have the, the photometric crash shift of the galaxy that we have associated with our algorithm. And you can see that the agreement between the two red shift is quite good. But if you look at the distribution, when you move from the, uh, the, the black distribution of the simulated redshift to the photometric ones, and then to the associated photometric ones, you can see that this is becoming larger. And so it, it, it will affect the estimate of the rate. So for, for the rate measurement, we will only focus on this redshift range to avoid systematics outside this area and also because of low number of objects uh, at the low redshift and the redshift uh, above 0 0.7. Last but not least, classification, because you need to have a reliable sample of supernova the type you were to use. So we tested different methods with, uh, let's say blind runs, no specific optimization because they are methods that have been used for other surveys. And the first one, is PSNID by Znana, which uh, allows you to, uh, to fit uh, your light curve with observed templates, and it produces a classification of all the supernova types plus an unknown category, which uh, it happens when it is not able to distinguish between different types. And this is an example when uh, you are not able to see if this is a, a 1A or of a, another type of supernova. And we are also testing other algorithm like supernova, which is based on a, a, a neural network. And we have in mind to, to fit light curve using the SAL2 model, which is one used for simulation. And for all these tests, for example, for PSNID, we tested it uh, without using any prior or redshift using a, a, a photometric, uh, the redshift with the photometric, uh, the photometric redshift that we associated and also the, the true redshift of the simulation. And you can see that it is very important to have a redshift, to have a, a reliable classification. So finally, we have all the ingredients to, to, to evaluate our rate. So in the redshift area that I mentioned before, we use this formula when time is 3.5 years, which is the effective time of observation from the first to the, to the last observation. And we evaluated this efficiency to take into account all the problems related to detection and different observational strategies. And this is because we just want to evaluate the effects of the uh, systematic uncertainties. So let's add them one by one to see what happens. If you add the problem of photometric crash shift, you can see that this is the results. Here you see the number of the two samples. So with photometric crash shift is lower because of the different distribution that I showed you before. If you add the problem of the association of the host galaxy, you see this one. So the number is still lowering and you, you will have this problem in evaluating the rate. So now we have the problem of the classification. This is just classification because here we are using the spectroscopic redshift as a prior. And what you can see here is this bias at low redshift. We are trying to fix it. It's maybe a problem with the classificator. So we are trying to understand how to solve this problem. And finally, the real case is when you have everything because you use only classified uh, correctly classified supernovae with photometric redshift and associated to correct galaxies. So this is what you're going to have. So putting everything together, you can observe two effects. The first one is of course, that the number of supernovae in each redshift bin is lower. So you can estimate this missing fraction to have an idea of how these systematic effects are impacting on the rate. And the second effect, is that if you try to, to fit a load, we fitted this power law, which is the one used for the simulation, you can see that there is a change on the functional form. And this is a problem if you want to use the rates to put constraint on the progenitors, as I told you in the first slide. So here you see the difference between the alpha and beta parameters. So as I'm running out of time, so th th these are the, the, the conclusion of the, uh, of the work. Uh, and I want to point out that it is a very big problem and photometric redshift are actually the biggest issue because they are impacting for 15% on the measure on the rate, 
while the uh, association and classification impact just for five and three percent. And another good thing that I, I want to, to, to point out is that this is a good test for the Rubin Sense platform because all this work can be executed on the platform without downloading data. So it's a very good test for the future. And so for future perspective, I, I think that we need to, to, to continue our analysis with a, a better algorithm of photometric redshift and classification, uh, new simulation to estimate the effect of contamination and also new simulation to estimate the correlation between the supernova type and the host galaxy properties. And finally, last but not least, the problem of photometric redshift. So possible synergies with other facility, especially with Euclid and near infrared could help to have reliable photometric redshift. Thank you. Thank you, Vincenzo. You were perfectly on time. Thank you. Question for Vincenzo? No? I have one myself, if I may. Uh, you pointed out the use uh, the application of data preview zero. Uh, you, uh, I know you explore a lot of difference within the 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. And so can you just highlight the, some uh, different uh, peculiar for this case and some suggestion for future, for future data release? Um, okay, data. so quite everything in this work is actually based on DP0.1. And I was using light curves producing, uh, producing on different images because I was using data produced by desk. Uh, the idea now would be to uh, reproduce the same analysis on DP0.2, but there's the problem of the offset within the light curves. So we're still evaluating that because if you want to use a classificator, then you need to take into account these offsets and it is introducing another systematic effect. What we have in mind for sure is to test the algorithm for the association of the host galaxy again with DP0.2, because this new version of the pipeline may produce better result because it has a better blender and things like that. So we, we have in mind to, to upload it because uh, the pipeline is still uh, something that is changing. So the, it may be better. Thank you, Vincenzo. There is another question, just a comment on that. This is very important because uh, this is the kind of feedback uh, that a DP0 delegate should uh, provide. So thank you for that. Familiar? Uh, just a very quick question. Uh, you show the different uh, performances of the of the, classif the classifier. Uh, just like before. Yeah, this one. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, I, I, made, I'm, I made the same question yesterday. Uh, but it said something is striking me. Um, it, we, when you use uh, the re, um, spectroscopic or photometric redshift, you are using a, a information from the host galaxies. Uh, when you are not using the uh, the, the redshift prior, uh, did you were you able to increase the number of filters, or you uh, were using always for each? test the same number of filters uh, for the light course? No, I, I am always using all the filters that I have available. So my only criterion is to select light course with at least five detection in every filter. Uh, so much, I use everything that I have. How many filters were you able to collect? I, I would say- Most I, of I the mean, light course have observation in G, R, and I bands yeah. because that get the observing strategy that have been used for DP0. So sometimes I also have you, uh, and T -T I, Z, or Y bands, but most of the filters, are, it's just G, R, and I. And were you able to test if increasing the number of filters increase the uh, the the performance of the classificator without adding the, the redshift prior? Mm, I, I, I did not, uh, because okay. as I was saying, it, it is a problem of, we are just using this simulation. So with this observing strategy yeah. and with these filters, we are not simulating other light curves. Okay, okay, thank you. And let's thank Michels again. Next speaker is Laura Venuti.
Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Lara Venuti. I am a research scientist at the SETI Institute in California. And I will talk about the phenomenology of uh, uh, young star variability in the optics of what can be achieved in Rubin LSST. So for the purpose of this talk, young stars are defined as uh, objects younger than about 10 million years, which probably means that they are in the protoplanetary disk stage of their evolution. And uh, I will focus in particular on stars that are actively interacting and accreting mass, sorry, and accreting mass from the uh, circumstellar disk. Because the star disk interaction uh, um, develops on special scales that are often too small to be resolved with interferometric or direct imaging facilities, uh, a most efficient approach to study the inner disk dynamics is to uh, trace the distinctive uh, signatures that the inner disk processes leave across the wavelength spectrum, from the UV, which is sensitive to the energetic emission from the accretion shocks, to the optical that traces photospheric uh, properties, to the infrared that traces thermal emission from the disk. Variability is a defining feature of young stars. And indeed, uh, uh, yeah, variations, photometric variations are observed on young stars across the wavelength spectrum and on all different time scales from order of hours to order of decades, as is summarized on this plot. And this here, it's critical to note, to note that uh, Rubin LSST, thanks to its design, will be sensitive to all of these different time scales of variability. Uh, most of the dynamical features that you observe uh, are driven by the day to weeks time scales, uh, which contribution from uh, uh, magnetic activity and flux modulations by star spots, uh, from uh, variable accretion dynamics uh, 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 that take place in the inner disk, uh, to uh, the specific geometric configuration of the star disk system, and the resulting uh, uh, circumstellar extinction events. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, reconstructing the emission spectrum of young stars is critical to, uh, to disentangle the different physical processes that take place in the inner disk. And uh, in fact, if you uh, compare this, the spectral energy distribution of a young accreting star surrounded by thick disk and a young non-accreting star surrounded by more evolved disk, uh, you can see some distinctive features that will be accessible to uh, LSST filters. Indeed, the, the bluest LSST filters, like U and G, uh, will probe the, uh, the excess emission driven by accretion on, onto the star, whereas the, the uh, optical, the redder filters, like R and I, uh, will be sensitive to the photospheric properties of the star. So by combining the, the multi-wavelength observations on color-color diagrams, we are provided with a strong tool to uh, first uh, estimate the, the, the photospheric properties of each star, and then to uh, uh, identify accreting stars and measure the uh, accretion, the mass accretion rate from the uh, from the, U, the from the blue color axis observed with respect to the uh, photometric properties of non-accreting stars. In recent years, a very detailed picture of uh, the different types of photometric behaviors of young stars has been provided by uh, space-based monitoring campaigns, such as those uh, conducted with Kepler. So this diagram shows a few, uh, a few examples that illustrate how different the, the photometric behaviors of young stars can be, from purely periodic driven by star spot modulation to bursting driven by um, uh, short-lived uh, intense accretion events, to dipping, which are driven by, um, uh, by inner disk dust structures that occult part of the stellar photosphere in uh, view, near uh, John viewing geometries. However, these surveys have so far been limited to the few star forming regions that are accessible from space, for, from space based observatories. And they were often uh, accompanied by very little uh, color information, which, is, which prevents uh, detailed classification and characterization of the observed variability properties. So, this is where Rubin LSST will be transformative because it will allow us to provide a deep, uniform census of the wavelength dependent variability behaviors for uh, young star clusters in diverse environments, thereby allowing us to probe uh, trends with mass and age and the impact of different environments. Uh, in very recent work, we, uh, we simulated the likelihood to detect 
short-lived variability events, such as bursting behaviors uh, with LSST, taking into account the fact that uh, observations will be limited to the night window in these optical filters. And what we found is that very uh, brief uh, monitoring campaigns lasting just about one week uh, will, be, uh, will allow us to efficiently probe, uh, identify short-lived variability phenomena uh, if a dense uh, hourly coverage of the monitoring uh, of, the, of the photometric variability can be achieved. Uh, so this kind of service would represent an ideal complementary approach to the more general SSD wild pass tip uh, survey strategy uh, to sample the variability of young stars across all different time scales and to uh, put the longer term variability uh, into context. And uh, again, uh, the availability of multiple of observations in multiple filters will be critical to allow us to build uh, contemporaneous uh, diagrams of variability on uh, uh, magnitude and on color, uh, where we can easily distinguish the accretion related variability by the steep um, dependence on the wavelength from uh, variability driven by, uh, by uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic star spots with uh, uh, less color dependence and um, from uh, occultation events, which tend to follow uh, an extinction law. And uh, as we combine uh, the measure, the contemporaneous uh, measurements of amplitudes of variability in different filters, uh, this wavelength dependence, dependence provides critical constraints for, uh, for theoretical models uh, and to uh, determine the properties of the, uh, the surface of the star and in the circumstellar environment. Indeed, for stars that are uh, with variability driven by uh, modulation by, uh, hot by cold magnetic spots or hot accretion spots, uh, the, the uh, uh, wavelength dependence of the measured amplitude of variability uh, allows us to constrain uh, the surface uh, fractional coverage by spot and the temperature difference with respect to the photosphere. While for dipping variables, uh, the wavelength dependence of the measured depth uh, of the dips allows us to constrain uh, the, the grain uh, properties such as uh, the size and the distribution uh, that are required for uh, the structures in the uh, inner disk environment to produce the observed behaviors. Uh, as we move to longer time scales of variability, some uh, prominent variability types can be observed in the form of EXOR uh, type variables, which show uh, sudden, uh, which show intense uh, brightening events uh, of orders of magnitudes and taking place over time scales of months to years. But uh, a lower level long-term variability can also be observed uh, as a result of, uh, of uh, structural changes in the inner disk, in the inner disk structure. Uh, and uh, this can be uh, identified by uh, computing a, a, a moving average of the normalized variability amplitude as a function of the, of the time scale uh, ranging, ranging from the data cadence to the entire time series duration. However, much of our understanding of this long-term variability is driven by a few uh, cases that are followed up individually. Uh, so we really need a, a systematic survey, a homogeneous survey of young star variability at all time scales in order to uh, assess how frequent, how common long-term variability uh, is uh, for young stars and what kind of physical conditions on the shorter term can evolve and lead to long-term instabilities. And this point is summarized on this recent result that compares the amplitude of variability measured on the mass accretion rate onto the star uh, on different time scales from, uh, few, from days to few years uh, for a sample of stars in the Orion Nebula cluster. And here you can see that although as we move to longer time scales, longer term variables start to emerge, uh, when we actually uh, have data for a large statistical sample, uh, we see that the uh, average amount of variability across for each time scale is still consistent with what we measure on day to weeks time scales. So to conclude, uh, in order to uh, derive a comprehensive view of young star variability across all time scales from hours to decades, we need uh, a survey that, that uh, covers the different time scales of variability uh, with, a consistent, with a consistent approach with sensitivity to all of the different inner disk processes with high spatial resolution to resolve the individual stellar members of clusters and uh, in a very stable photometric with a very stable photometric prescription. 
And this is exactly why Ruby and LSST uh, will be uniquely placed in the next decade to answer many of these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Questions for Laura? Yeah, I have one quick question for you. Uh, just to introduce the conference uh, that will follow soon. I'm sorry, we are late. In fact, uh, I apologize. Some people will have to left because of that. Probably, uh, uh, you you also work on spectroscopic data. Again, uh, can you comment on the yes some so, application for this case? Yes, for instance. Uh, by envisioning, like for instance, a short-term dedicated photometric monitoring campaign to constrain the variability of young stars on, on rotational time scales, we'll be able to also collect uh, supporting simultaneous spectroscopic follow-up data, which are critical to um, to characterize the nature of the systems, to confirm the accreting uh, nature of the system, to confirm the to derive an accurate estimate of the uh, photospheric parameters. Uh, and and to uh, also derive uh, a, a broader view of the geometry of the of the inner disk of the circumstellar environment. Thank you, Laura. If there are no other questions, let's turn to Laura then. Next speaker is Anna. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Anupam Bhardwaj, and I will talk about distance indicators, mostly in global clusters using GTF data, and which has which basically have potentials for uh, potential applications in the LSST era. So when I say distance indicators, I'm interested in radially pulsating stars such as Cepheids and RLIs, which are located in the instability strip in the HR diagram, or MIRAs, which are AGV stars. So why are these stars important? Because they exhibit period luminosity relations, which come basically from period mean density equation combined with the steepen boltzmann law. And this relation makes these stars as excellent distance indicators or stellar standard candles. So I'm interested in GTF, exploring GTF data, particularly because it provides uh, multiband photometry in GRI filters, which are somewhat similar to LSST. Of course, LSST will provide photometry in six different filters and more importantly, provide an unprecedented uh, order of magnitude increase in the, in the data, nightly data for uh, variables and in general. So I started looking at uh, variables uh, in LSST-like filters, investigating their pulsation properties. And this is one example for uh, Messier 15 global clusters, looking at RLI rays and type two cephids. So this is the color magnitude diagram, and you can see that the horizontal branch is quite well populated. So you, here we have uh, RLI rays pulsating in different modes and also type two cephids. The plot on the right shows the color uh, zoom in on the color magnitude diagram and the, the predicted boundaries of the instability strip are also over plotted. And you can see that they fit quite well uh, the empirical observation. So this way we can also compare directly the model predictions. So these are some example light curves that we had for uh, RRLI variables in M15 and also for type two cephids. Of course, we looked at various pulsation properties and including the period luminosity relations. This is the I-band period luminosity relations for RLI rays, and we can see that this is quite well constrained with a scatter only of, of the order of 0.05 mag. That means that we can derive very precise distances even using just the optical uh, photometry for these variables, which is quite interesting because LSST will provide these data uh, for a number of RLI rays. So we started investigating more uh, these pulsation properties in these filters and JTF was the obvious choice. So we started looking at RLI rays in number of global clusters, so more than 1200 RLI rays in 57 global clusters covering nearly two decks of metallicity range. And we, so these are some examples and you have more than 300 data points uh, for a number of light curves uh, for RLI rays in global clusters. 
And we adopted homogeneous distances, reddening, and metallicities from the literature to look into the pulsation properties and to calibrate their uh, period luminosity relations in particular. Of course, the spatial resolution, resolution of GTF is not great. So uh, since global clusters are crowded fields, so we have to, uh, there are issues in the light curves. Light curves are spurious due to blending and other crowding effects. So we had to throw away a number of light curves and apply several uh, selection criteria. And we ended up with, a, with around 750 RLI rays in 46 global clusters. Of course, this does not affect the metallicity range because we have RLI rays in almost all the global clusters. And then we looked at the period luminosity relations and more importantly, tried to quantify the effect of metallicity on these relations, which is quite crucial uh, if you want to calibrate their period luminosity metallicity relations. Uh, at the same time, there are also theoretical efforts going on to look at the dependence of metallicity uh, in, in, for RRLI repeated luminosity relations, especially in Rubin LSST filter. This plot has already been shown by Massimo. And, you can, and this provides us an opportunity to compare both empirical and theoretical relations. So this is uh, just looking at this table here. Uh, we can clearly see that in, in, uh, if we look at the period luminosity relations, there is quite a strong dependence of metallicity uh, in the period luminosity relations. But there are certain combination of, uh, these are, when I say W, these are best and height relations, which are constructed in a way to be reddening independent. So these are basically period luminosity color relations. And some of these relations are quite uh, show a smaller dependence of, on metallicity, which is quite promising if we want to use these uh, as a distance indicators using uh, optical data. So we also looked at type two cepheids. Uh, again, the similar exercise, we had around 37 type two cepheids in 18 different global clusters covering metallicity range of nearly two decks. And using the similar approach as of RR Lyris, we looked at their period luminosity relations, period Wesson height relations, and investigated the metallicity coefficient or metallicity dependence on these period luminosity relations. Uh, for RR Lyris, uh, for type 2 cephids, we did not find any significant metallicity coefficient, and it is mostly consistent with zero, except maybe uh, at the shortest wavelengths. And this is also, again, in agreement with the theoretical predictions uh, for type 2 cephids based on uh, pulsation models. Uh, I'm also looking at classical cephids and myras. These are, of course, uh, not in the global cluster. So this is one example of... Uh, this is one example light curves for, uh, for classical cephids. These are uh, observed with REM. Uh, these are mostly in the optical bands in GRIG and also in infrared bands. This is ongoing work. So the idea was to calibrate, to use the multivalent approach to, to, to estimate reddening and use Gaia parallaxes to calibrate their period luminosity relations and also uh, quantify the metallicity effects, which because these relations will be quite useful in the LSST era, but also we can use these relations to derive templates. And for, for example, you compare uh, for a comparison with the models. I've also looked at MIRAs. Uh, so one specifically properties of MIRAs at, uh, at the maximum light, where they seem to show quite a strong period luminosity and period luminosity color relations uh, with which exhibit a scatter mostly nearly 30 times smaller scatter than what we do, what we get from the tra traditional mean light relations. And this is again quite promising uh, for LSST because we'll have a number of MIRAs in external galaxies uh, over the 10 year uh, time scale. So we are already late for this, so I'll keep it short. And if you are interested in talking about any of these projects, uh, you can talk to me, thank you. Thank you, Anupan, for being perfectly on time and be early. Questions for Anupan? Um, okay, maybe we can, uh, you were very clear, sorry. Okay, thank you. And so uh, let's thank Anupan again. And the last, uh, the last talk is from Sabina Ustamovic.
and uh, with the Salif McFarlane remote connection, it starts. Okay. Sally, are you connected? Can you hear us? Let's try. Sally, can you unmute yourself? There we go. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's that's good. Uh, and there we go. So I just needed the, the host to let me. Uh, yeah, so I'll uh, carry on. Um, Sabina, if you could control the slides. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, just to uh, quickly get into it, our presentation is going to be just a glimpse and a brief look at uh, the data visualization and representation subgroup. So one of the newest, uh, not the newest uh, subgroup in TBS. So the question is, uh, why do we do data visualization? Why are we interested in data visualization? Well, uh, as we move into the era of big data with the uh, up uh, with massive surveys such as uh, Ruben LSST, it's very important that we develop uh, new and inclusive multi-sensory methods to be able to handle uh, and quickly handle these complex multi-dimensional data and how it's communicated to researchers and the public. So with this goal in mind, we created, uh, well, we developed the TVS subgroup that aims to explore and actively promote the development and use of uh, these multi-sensory data exploration tools and associated software for the purposes of inclusive science communication to the LSS uh, communication of LSST data um, uh, visualization. Next slide, please. So just a brief introduction to myself. Um, my name is uh, Sally McFarlane. And I am from the South African Astronomical Observatory, uh, where I'm working as a postdoc. Uh, Sabina, my fellow co-chair, will um, can introduce herself uh, in just a bit when she describes her work. Next slide, please. So just to go over some of the aims, um, we aim to uh, support and promote research into multidisciplinary uh, visualization. Um, and it says there's sonification, but really it's all sorts of data exploration of LSST TBS data. And also to support and promote the use of multidimensional visualization and these are tools, exploration tools, for the purpose of um, for the purpose of inclusive science communication. So this is also for educational and outreach purposes, as well as research. And also to investigate the, effect, uh, the effectiveness of uh, using such methods. So not only what's quite exciting is not only is this relevant for the TVS subgroup, um, the DataVis subgroup itself, but also for other subgroups in the TVS uh, collaboration, as well as other science collaborations in LSST. Next slide, please. So just to detail a little bit about the activities, we're looking at uh, these, but this by no means is all inclusive and we're really open to new suggestions. So just to get us started, we've been looking at data sonification, digital domes, VR, 3D printed models. And uh, of these, Sabina will, will go over VR and 3D printed models. But just to, uh, my expertise lie mainly with digital domes. So if you go to the next slide, please. And you can start the videos. So I, uh, date, we've been using digital domes to try and effectively visualize some of these large data sets. In that first, it's very difficult to get an, an idea of uh, the 3D space on a 2D screen, but uh, you can trust me, this gives you a new, uh, the researcher or viewers in the room to get a new perspective on their data. 
and to start asking new queries. So it's really important, especially in the discovery phase um, of your pipeline. And you can see there in the first one, we're looking at a 3D particle data set where each point there is a galaxy. In the next one, we're looking at a volumetric rendering of a mouse brain in space. So uh, that's just a bit about my research. I'll pass over now to Sabina to go and talk about her research. Uh, now I'm I'm going to to present my part, which is more uh, related to the part of uh, with virtual reality and uh, 3D printed models. Uh, I'm uh, working on a project uh, uh, about variability and young stellar objects uh, with Rubin SST, uh, where we combine observations and and models. Uh, the it started as a Kickstarter project, and the main collaborators are uh, Sara Bonito and uh, Laura Venuti. And this picture is from a workshop that we organized in Palermo some months ago. Uh, so uh, the, the, the aim of this project is to study, to investigate the variability in young stellar objects at different time scales. So to, to this end, we are working on two parts. Uh, on one hand, uh, we are uh, analyzing uh, light cores from public data sets in order to identify different kinds of variability. Uh, in preparation for, for Rubin LSST data. And on the other hand, we are uh, developing uh, models and uh, 3D renderings in order to reproduce the, ge the geometry of static systems that could reproduce the variability we are observing in, in these data sets. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on this part, which is more related with the topics of our subgroup. So um, being uh, aware of the importance of, uh, of representing uh, and visualizing the uh, 3D data, uh, in Palermo a couple of years ago, we started the project 3D Map VR, uh, where uh, we combine uh, 3D magnetodynamical simulations with uh, data analysis and visualization applications in order to create uh, public galleries of scientific models. Uh, for the models, we are using uh, Sketchfab, which is a completely free platform where you can uh, visualize the models using a browser and also with virtual reality devices if, if available. So the, the, already, the products that we already have available uh, from this project are uh, some web series in Italian and English, a uh, publicly available app uh, called Star Blast for virtual reality. And uh, there are uh, four Sketchfab galleries to illustrate scientific models of uh, astrophysical objects. Uh, in the first gallery, which is called Universe in Hands, uh, which we present uh, models that are coming from uh, numerical simulations, as the samples you can show here, where you, you see a, a jet. Uh, and uh, the, the other galleries uh, represent um, represent artistic views of, uh, of different astrophysical phenomena, of course, trying to represent accur accurately uh, the, the current knowledge we have about that phenomena. Uh, all these models can be observed uh, in a fully immersive VR, where you can um, explore uh, the models and interact with them, as you can see, as you can see in, this, uh, in this movie. Um, a follow-up uh, of this project uh, is to create uh, 3D printable models. Uh, this, uh, in order to, to present uh, all, the, uh, all the models also to visually impaired researchers. Uh, this approach has already been taken by NASA where they have adapted some of our models, uh, which some of them are already uh, published in their web page. This is a jet of a young star, and this is the supernova remnant, uh, supernova remnant IC443. Uh, here I can show you an example. This is a different ejecta that you can show in, uh, in, in this animation, and this is the molecular file that shapes this, uh, this supernova remnant. Uh, we are also creating our own catalog of models that uh, in the same way can represent uh, the variability we observe in, in, in young stars, always related with the star disk system. Uh, here I show uh, some, some examples uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we have. Oops, sorry. 
uh, this is a, a star disk system a warp disk uh, a Christian disk uh, rotating around a young star and this is a very simple model about uh, a star where uh, with a spot which is represented with different pattern which can be scaled depending on the case on the case uh, the, we are at the moment performing some uh, printing tests in order to make available the models for the community. And uh, I would like to highlight that the importance of, of, of this activity is uh, to, to create a more inclusive environment, which where all the science of proving could also be presented to visually impaired members of the community. And uh, just to, to finish, I would like to invite you to, if you are interested in these topics, I would like to, to invite you to join us uh, on our new subgroup where we, if we are inter you are interested, you can join uh, our Slack group when we, we are going to post uh, our next activities and meetings. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sabina, and thank Sally also for uh, the part of the talk, uh, Gabriel Mother. Have you any questions for Sabina and Sally? There is one. Very good question. Are these tools available for education too, or just is or are taught just for the research? For the education. The edu we actually, yeah. Um, I guess. Some of the of the models are are coming from um, from numerical simulations, but of course we don't have simulation of all the astrophysical phenomena. And in order to have uh, more ca cases to show in uh, in uh, in when we are when we are uh, uh, organizing some kind of events for dissemination, we created also other galleries where we represent in an artistic way the, the phenomena uh, of these different phenomena. And we, we have also in Palermo uh, the virtual devices. And always when we organize uh, some events with the public, we always show our models with, with the devices. And actually it's a very successful way of attract people. There are always long queues. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if, okay, is there are no other questions? Let's thank Sabine and Sally again. And uh, now we will have the possible session. We we'll start with uh, Andini. Yeah, we have uh, three flash talks of one minute each. For uh, and you can you can start going, and uh, you can find the video recorded on the YouTube channel. Uh, then I can invite you also to see more closer. <laughs> closer the 3D model. Maybe I ask for the um, for the uh, coffee break. Sabina, maybe we can wait for, uh, yeah, we also ask for the coffee break to wait for us. And for those interested for the unconference on the spectroscopic, uh, it will be here. So we have time for a coffee break and then join here again. So the first speaker is Nandini. Hello everyone, good evening. My name is my name is Nandini Hazra. Um, my work focuses on distance indicators, primarily the surface brightness fluctuations method. Um, in this, we use the pixel to pixel variation, the spatial fluctuations due to the underlying surface brightness of unresolved stars and galaxies uh, as a distance indicator. This is a very, very accurate method, uh, giving us accurate measurements up to four or 5% for individual measures and even lower for group measures and works very well up to the 100 megaparsec regime, which would be a very big asset for Rubin in the upcoming uh, era of uh, eight major class te telescopes. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, please watch my video poster or come ask me. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the organization of the, the talks. Um, I'm Frédéric Poisson from the ISC in Tenerife. Uh, with a, a group of collaborators, we work on superluminous supernovae. And, uh, more precisely, we, we conduct uh, polarimetry surveys, so we'll give you a, a bit of explanations. 
First, we, we use spectroscopy to classify the superluminous supernovae. One of the, our colleagues shown recently that there are two subclasses of H4 superluminous supernovae, the W type and 15 BN type. And we also use uh, photometry from ZTF and ATLAS to study uh, the magnetar model and the light curves. And uh, LSST data will be useful because it's not clear if the W type, uh, the W type is showing uh, an early bump, but it's not clear for the other types. So we don't know if there are different progenitors. And finally, we use polarimetry. Um, there are only uh, 10 superluminous supernovae that have been observed with polarimetry. Mm -hmm. To learn about the, the the progenitor in some in one case there was an evolution of the polarimetry with time 15 bn which is showing that the loss of symmetry could be related to the central engine and since there are only a few few data we are expanding the 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 sample so if you have any interest in superluminous supernovae please uh, i will be happy to discuss with you thank you This one is uh, online. Good, good evening, everybody. I'm Przemek Mikołajczyk from the University of Warsaw, and uh, I would I'd like to advertise to you BHTOM, which stands for Black Hole TOM, and is a tool based uh, on TOM Toolkit from Las Cumbres Observatory, and is basically a web service which allows you to quickly obtain uh, to quickly obtain time series photometric data for your desired object. So what you would like to do is to go to the bhtom.space and to browse around our webpage. Uh, you can uh, create your desired target and by the means of our 75 telescopes um, in our network, you will quickly obtain multi-core, multi-band photometry for your object. And uh, we are now expanding our network for new telescopes and as well as for the radio observations to further expand multi-wavelength uh, support. And, and um, so far we have mostly observed Gaia science alerts uh, in multi-band photometry, but uh, our service will be perfect tool for observing and providing follow-up for LSST science alerts, as well as our uh, sky coverage extends somewhere uh, towards 20 magnitudes in V-band. So for more information, I will paste the whole poster to the Slack channel and please ask me any questions in the Slack if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending this session. We're, we're running late and uh, the coffee break is still available for us. And then uh, in this room, there will be the spectroscopic uh, follow-up for Rubin LSST, uh, an example focus on uh, young stellar objects, but everybody is welcome to join. So we'll start later here. Thank you. Thank you.